I'm new to the field of healthcare and I've been working in a nursing home for about six months now. I don't know if I necessarily believe in ghosts, but I definitely believe in energy. I've asked lots of my co-workers to share with me all their stories about our campus. I figure, so many people have died here over the years, there's bound to be stories. I've heard the garden variety, little girl visits residents before they're about to die, and cold spot on the third floor near the elevator stories, but nothing that really scared me. One night, on a slow third shift, me and a co-worker used that energy field TikTok filter to see if we could find ghosts in the dining room. And there were some creepy impressions on the chairs of residents who died. Around the time my first resident in hospice was dying, the nurse was going over the death procedures and report. A lot of us were new, so she was filling it as in. She told us to always speak to the body as if it could respond, even if they hadn't spoken in days, even if they were dead. We assumed that it was a sign of respect to the resident and family members that might be in the room. The nurse clarified that it was because they believed the body might still be able to hear us. I was surprised that the nurse would state something of such a subjective nature, but she went on to tell us that this is the stance that our company takes. As far as they're concerned, ghosts are real. It was strange to hear a company acknowledge the existence of ghosts. We were also told not to open the windows in a dying resident's room because it might go against the family's wishes. I asked for clarification and the nurse explained that opening the window lets out the spirit and sometimes the families want the spirit to hold on. She said that co-workers had even been written up for doing that before. I kept that in the back of my mind. Over the next few weeks, the resident on hospice deteriorated. They'd been bedbound for almost a month. We positioned them every two hours to reduce bed sores. Eventually, they stopped responding to cues. They hadn't eaten for more than a week. They were given a morphine drip for pain because they couldn't take it any other way, but they were still holding on. The family had been spending the entire month with them on shifts, and we kind of got the impression that the resident didn't want to pass in front of their family. The family went to visit the resident's wife's grave, and the nurse told us apparently they asked the spirit of the wife to return to the resident's room with them and give them permission to pass. They still held on, and the family all went home for the first night since they went on hospice. I had that resident's care for the night, and I briefly thought about opening the window. Since they were unable to follow cues, I had another co-worker assist me. I asked her if she'd ever opened a window on a residence, but she said no. But she told me a story of another co-worker of ours who had. Apparently, they spoke to the resident and told them it was okay to leave, opened the window, left the room to put some towels on the wash, and when they came back, the resident was dead. I asked her if she thought we should, knowing we could get in trouble for it. After all, I'd been told about it with explicit directions not to, but we decided to open the window. I did it, and my co-worker spoke to the resident. I was surprised about how affectionately she spoke to them, because even when they were more active, None of us were particularly close with them. She told me the family loved them, very much, and they'd taken care of and safe. That it was okay for them to let go, and we just didn't want them to be in pain anymore. We left the room for a moment, thinking they might want some privacy, and returned after about a minute. It was a cold night out, so we didn't want too much cold air to come into the room, and actually harm the resident. They were still visibly breathing, so we shrugged and continued care. After we were done with the room, I continued about my night. Not an hour later, the nurse told us that they'd passed. I still don't know what I believe, but it was wild for my company to take such a strong position on ghosts, and then for their specific law to be backed up in real life. I guess ghosts can't go through walls. I'll set the scene first, since it's necessary to explain how I do not believe what I saw was a living person. Our nursing home is basically one giant hallway with many rooms on both sides. I was exiting one resident's room after completing care very late at night, about 10.30pm. After 8pm, half of the fluorescent lights shut off, so the end of the hallway was very dark. 
I was near the end of the building, with only two rooms to the right of me, and the rest of the building to my left. After care is completed, you're supposed to shut the residence door. And since most people like to go to bed earlier than the room I was in, all of the doors were already shut. All of the doors are fireproof rated for up to one and a half hours, so they're very large and heavy doors. It's quite difficult to shut them without making a sound, and we often have residents yell at us if we accidentally slam the doors too hard. They also have a tendency of closing on their own and not staying propped open. With it being so late, most of the second shift had already left for the night. It was only me and two other PCAs on that side of the building, and I knew the relative location of each one. As I was maybe about five feet from the door, I saw something walk in front of it in the hallway, pacing from left to right at a medium pace. They were about five foot in height, hunched over, and looked to be wearing dark blue. As the hallway was so dark, I couldn't make out their faces or any details. Nothing struck me as off about the encounter at first. I simply thought it was a co-worker, because one of us was wearing dark blue scrubs that night. As soon as they passed by the door, I rushed up to it and peeked my head out to see who it was, out of curiosity. But there was no one there. The end of the hall is directly to my right, so there was nowhere they could have gone. All of the doors to the other rooms were closed, and they couldn't have ducked into a room and shut the door that quietly, or quickly. They simply walked past the door and disappeared. I felt very shaken up, but didn't say anything and went about my night, trying to find some kind of rational explanation for what had happened. Later on, my supervisor came up to me with wide eyes and told me she'd felt something. I still hadn't told her what of what I saw. Basically, she'd gone into one of the rooms on the right of where I saw the apparition a while after I'd finished care, and she felt like someone was staring at her the whole time, to the extent she kept turning around to see if someone was there. This particular room is the last room in the hallway, and has the rare feature of having two exterior walls, being on the corner of the building. Twice as many windows as the other rooms, I shared with her what I saw. We were pretty spooked out, so we stayed close together for the rest of the night. Around that same time, the resident in between the room where I saw the apparition, and where my supervisor felt like she was being watched, started to decline and eventually passed away. Before his death, he'd tell us he saw his late wife watching him from outside of his window. This was a few years ago now, and went on for a year or so. We went on over to Edinburgh and went on the dungeon tour. We get brought to the most haunted part of the dungeons. Dark chamber, not too big, and with a stone circle in the middle. And they turn the lights off. Now to be fair, we're all primed and ready to be spooked with the stories, etc. They turn the lights off, and from across the darkness of the room, I see a malicious face appear and slowly, almost jauntily float over and pull up right into my face. It's going back and forth and seems to be mocking me and laughing at me, staying really close to my face. I feel like he's actively trying to intimidate me. It goes on for long enough that I'm starting to panic a bit, but I don't want to show it that I'm panicking. Thankfully, one of the other tourists touched off another. They screamed and the lights got turned back on. Genuinely, I didn't think much of it because I'd be sceptical enough, but was pretty freaked out. A few months passed and I ended up moving into a house with friends. On the landing, whatever way the lights in the house worked, we'd often be in the dark going up to our bedrooms. And on that landing, when completely dark and alone, I'd see that face again, maybe five or six times. He'd always try to stop me getting to my room and always appear right at the top of the stairs. I don't know if it's relevant, but I always felt safe in my room and that nothing would enter without being specifically allowed. We had some other weird things in that house. An old woman was seen by different people in the corner of the sitting room and I was sure I saw her looking down on someone staying on our couches. Also, the coldest house in existence. Haven't seen that face in a while, but it's always stuck with me. Think Evil Dead, Book of the Dead mixed with a devil gentleman. Does that ring any bells with anyone? Sound like anything specific? So 
So this happened about 10 or so years ago, but still freaks me and my mom out to this day. Some context. When my mom was in high school, she had this best friend that we'll call Emily. She and Emily were super close, even when my mom moved to the next province over. They kept in touch and talked a lot. Emily has this shitty boyfriend that my mom doesn't really talk about. All I know about him is what he did. On Valentine's Day, a few years before I was born, and a couple years after my mom and Emily graduated, Emily's boyfriend murdered her and then killed himself. Mom's never told me much about the murder-suicide aside from that, and I've never pressed her for details. So here's where the paranormal stuff comes in. For graduation, Emily bought my mom these two antique candle holders. After we'd moved out of my dad's house, my mom always kept them on top of the TV. We had one of those really old ones that was super thick. The house was small and there was an actual dining room. So my mom just stuck our little table in a corner of the living room behind the couch. One Valentine's day, we were eating dinner at the table and I was about seven. I asked my mom how she was doing, because obviously Valentine's Day is really hard for her. She starts talking about Emily and just saying how much she misses her, and I shit you not, one of the candle holders flies off the TV and absolutely shatters all over the shag carpet. This is weird, because obviously we were across the room, and no one was even near the candle holder, and when I say shattered, I really mean it. We had this soft, fluffy shag carpet, And it'd be really difficult to get anything to shatter on it, even if you chucked it. So anyways, my mom played it off because seven-year-old me was obviously freaked out. But we still talk about it sometimes, and my mom likes to think it was just Emily, letting her know she's still around, and just wanted to say hi. So when this was going on, I was living in a three-story house. The three bedrooms in the house were on the top floor, and mine was the room closest to the stairs. Almost every night, for as far back as I can remember, when I looked out the doorway of my bedroom, I could see a shadow of a humanoid figure walking up the stairs, frozen in place. It had long arms and legs, and would always freak me out. Slowly, over about a year, the shadow inched its way further up a step, Only one step. I would tell my mom and dad about the walking shadows, but they would dismiss it as the shadow of the stair banister. I remember one time late at night, it must have been 1 or 2 a.m., when I finally noticed how close the shadow was to getting to my room, and I absolutely freaked out. I started loudly pleading with the shadow and begging it to just not just hurt my favourite stuffed animal, and to take anything else but my favourite stuffed animal. I was so loud, I woke up my parents who tried to calm me down for the rest of the night. They never even looked in the direction of the shadow. They continued to blame the shadow on the banister, but last time I checked, the banister did not look humanoid and definitely didn't move. When I was six, my parents divorced, but my dad didn't sell the house. Now it was just me and him in this sizable three-story house. My dad got partial custody of me, so I was at this house every Tuesday night and Wednesday morning, as well as every other weekend. And every night I spent at his house was torture. The walking shadows continued to appear in the night. Then, when I was about eight years old, they went away for a couple months. They stopped appearing at night and I finally felt at peace. That was the quiet before the storm. During these couple months, my dad gave me these wonderful news that we were moving. Shortly after whatever the thing that was part of the walking shadows decided to come back from its little vacation. Instead of the shadows, however, it was now a little more present. Now at night, you could hear pots and pans banging around the kitchen on the first floor. Almost like someone was loudly and clumsily trying to make a three course meal. My father suffers from sleep apnea I used to sleep with a loud machine, so he never heard any of it. But I would hear it every night I slept over. Then we moved, and everything was fine for about a year or so. Then I would start to hear the pots and pans again. That went on for a couple months. Then I started getting night terrors. I was in the sixth grade at this point, and the lack of sleep became so bad that during recess, I would sleep on the bench outside, 
if only to get five minutes of needed sleep. It also showed in my grades as I fell asleep in my math class often. It was my first class of the day and ended up with a D as the final grade for that year. I remember one night in particular, and I'll never forget this. I felt a weight sit on my legs that I knew wasn't my dad. The weight stayed on my legs for about five minutes and then was gone. I didn't dare open my eyes during those five minutes, terrified of what I may or may not see. I didn't fall back asleep that night either. One other time, and I don't think I could ever forget this night either. I was in the seventh grade, about 12 years old, and I had to use the bathroom that night. So like any normal person, I got up and went down the hallway to use the bathroom. When I was done, I went to leave. And as I reached for the handle of the door, suddenly there was a violent banging at the door, a banging that I know my father would never do as he would yell at me for doing something like that. I had been groggy, but that banging certainly woke me up. I stayed in that bathroom for another 30 minutes after the banging ended. Then I opened the door of the bathroom quickly and made a run for it down the hallway towards my room. I got to my room quickly, flipped on the light and practically slammed the door. I don't know how important this is, but I can tell you that I saw the same walking shadows on the floor in front of my doorway as I was closing the door. I stayed awake for another hour or so, but the fact being that I was 12 and already sleep deprived, I soon turned off the lights and went back to sleep. I had a horrible nightmare that I can't really remember, but I remember the fear. The worst part was right before I woke up. That's the part I most definitely do remember. In the dream, I was in my room in the dark and all of a sudden, that same violent banging that I had dealt with in the bathroom, I was now experiencing against my bedroom door. And one of the worst aspects was that this time, my father's voice accompanied it, yelling, pleading for me to open the door. Then I jolted awake. It's been years since then, but nothing that extreme has happened. I still get nightmares, but nothing like that. God, I hope to never experience any of that situation again. To be entirely honest, I've never written this entire experience out before, and doing so shakes me up a little. And as cheesy as it sounds, while writing this, I've teared up several times. I believe what I've seen, felt and heard, and have nothing but fear towards these memories. My ex had an Iron Cross Nazi World War II medal stored in his basement. A relative visited him in World War II, took it off a Nazi he killed, and passed it down to him. Why he kept it for so long? Maybe to honour his relative who killed the Nazi? I do not know. My ex isn't racist, and insisted he does not support what they did, but kept it. He took it out from a case buried in his basement, and put it in his closet hoping to pawn it. I was there and, oh my god, it awoke something. Nothing had ever happened when it was in the case. I assure you, we were all wide awake and blind stinking sober. We could see a very angry face and shoulders emerge from the closet and just glare at us. His eye colour changing from bright blue to jet black. I'm indigenous, so I think he was mad that a person of colour was still alive and around. This affected me more than him. I kept seeing this angry face just float towards me every time I went into his bedroom, even in daylight. I would just freeze up and stare back, almost hypnotised. One night, we were watching TV and we both felt like somebody threw hot water on us. We jumped up screaming in pain, felt wet, then it immediately became nothing. The wetness disappeared and we were dry. My ex insisted we sleep downstairs and promised he wouldn't follow us. I asked, how do you know? I had horrid, closed-eye visions that night trying to sleep, but I assured myself I was not sleeping. Being gassed in the gas chamber and seeing children being murdered in the most horrific, disturbing way. I started screaming and crying, gasping for air too. I begged to get rid of it or else we were done. We went to the nearest city to pawn it. He said he doesn't support what they did to the employees. Most of them refused to take it. Some immediately backed into the back rooms. 
Finally, someone took it, saying, this isn't good, but some psycho might buy it. The scarier visions and haunting stopped completely afterwards. He refused to talk about it. I'll never forget that. It was my first haunting, but it was so intense and scary, I won't forget. Nothing will convince me this wasn't real. I was requested to tell my dad's ghost stories and experiences. Ever since he was little, he's always seen them. Anytime, anywhere. He doesn't really like telling us, his children, what he sees, because he thinks we might get scared. So he's only always told my mom what he sees. I only know of a few stories told to us by my mom. First story. My parents were waiting at a drive through at Tim Hortons. My dad was in the driver's seat when all of a sudden he started screaming while looking at his driver's window. My mom, of course, was startled and asked what was wrong. My dad said a man or woman appeared just outside his driver's side, but the person looked like he or she was in an accident and passed. Apparently, the person was all bloody and it just disappeared. Second story. When my dad was little, he was an altar boy for many years in the Philippines. One day, my dad was just cleaning near the pews when suddenly he could see a bunch of souls kneeling on the pews, praying and begging God for forgiveness. My dad said they all looked like they were in pain and agony. Third story. My parents attend this thing called Lord of Pardon. This is when people would go to random people's houses to pray every weekend or something. At the time of the prayer, the owner of the house would have three statues. Jesus on the cross, Mother Mary, and Santo Nino, baby Jesus. Whenever the prayer was done, the three statues would go to a new house who needs prayers. It could be a prayer for anything. If a family member passes, the group would bring it there in time of need. Anything. Anyway, my parents' friends texted my dad, asking if they wanted to come to the house to pray. My dad said sure, so they went to the house. They were praying in a row when all of a sudden my dad fell and created a domino effect so everyone ended up falling. My mom, who was beside him, was like, what the hell? And looked at my dad and his eyes were still shut so hard. My mom thought that was kind of weird. So right after the prayer, the owner offered food and drinks and my mom started eating and talking to people. My dad was talking to the owner when suddenly my dad wanted to leave the house. My mom was like, okay, so she left with him. He told her that while they were praying, he heard someone behind him mumbling, almost like praying with them, but he couldn't make up the words. That person behind him pushed him and he opened his eyes for a split second. And it was an old woman who pushed him to go in front of my dad who was near the statues. He said she turned around and my dad saw her face. He said she looked so angry and that's when he shut his eyes because he was terrified. So when the prayer was over, he was talking to the owner of the house and my dad was like, oh, where's your wife? And the owner said, oh, she's the person we're paying for today because she just passed away recently. And he pointed at a photo and it was the exact same woman who he saw was praying behind him. Fourth story. My dad's job requires going to his client's houses. One time, he was sitting in his client's living room and he saw an old woman just smiling at him at the stairs across the room and just slowly went back up the stairs. My dad asked the owner, oh, is that your mother? And the owner looked confused and he's like, oh, my mom passed away already. I live alone. My dad, of course, didn't want to say anything. So he just said, oh, okay, never mind. My dad said it seems like she's always just there watching over him because he sensed that she's a good soul. Fifth story. This happened about a year ago. My dad's job required him to move to a different province. My mom stayed with us for a bit while my dad moved out first. He was renting a townhouse for just a few months. One night, I got a few missed calls at like 12 a.m. from my dad. And I'm like, why is he calling me so much? So I called because I had a weird feeling. He picks up and starts whispering. I'm in my room, but I see someone downstairs and now it's moving furniture around. And I can see its shadow walking back and forth underneath my bedroom door. I tried calling your mom and your siblings, but they're not picking up their phones. I'm scared. I've never heard my dad scared like that before. He kept asking me, did you hear that? 
He was talking about chairs moving and he was shit scared. I felt so bad because he was all alone. So I eventually got hold of my mom with a free three-way call. After that incident, he got fed up and went to someone we know who's a spiritual healer. He asked her to remove his third eye and successfully she was able to lessen the activity. But my dad still hears things he doesn't really see as often as before, which is better than seeing them every day. Quick catch up. Kitchen cabinets open, door connecting the master bedroom and the guest bedroom kept opening, pulled toes, dog staring at something that's not there, etc. We got an obsidian and had a specialist come and check it out. There's a third bedroom on our side that the landlords use as storage. There's a balcony in the back and a lock on our side of the door. It's like a hoarder lives there. A lot of that shit needs to be tossed. Old stuff that will never be used for anything. Modern baby things, they don't have kids. Specialists said whatever is here is attached to something in that room and it's keeping the rest of the spirits here. Well, about two weeks ago, our obsidian broke. I didn't find out until yesterday and it explains a lot. Here are the new things. I was in the bathroom and saw my husband walk by to go downstairs. Stairs creaked in all the right places. I was going to bed and he was in the bedroom. Stairs are old and steep. Everyone trips or falls on them. We put up a sign to be careful. The sign fell. I had to zip tie it on either end of the banister until my husband could hang the shelf. Zip ties were ripped out. Friends are hearing full conversations while they're in the bathroom. Bathroom is right next to the storage room, by the way. Then they find out nobody was in the house. We'd been on the porch the whole time. This one got me today. I was downstairs with a dog falling into her nap trap. When she sleeps, it's like you can't fight it and you fall asleep too. I was fully awake at the time, just waiting for heavy eyes and it sounded like something was riding our desk chair around the guest room. It was loud and went on for about five minutes. It was weird because it sounded right on top of me, not on the neighbor's side. I wanted to make sure it wasn't him, so I texted. He wasn't moving anything. He said it must be the ghost. Yes. They experience things too. My friend is getting me another obsidian tomorrow. It's just wild and happening all the time now. It mimics my husband and only messes with me and other females. One thing to cover quickly. My husband does not handle these things well. He doesn't know how to protect me or fight something like this, so it really freaks me out. He's a Cajun from Homar. Voodoo priestesses and priests live down there. Cajuns don't mess around or play with things like this. Advice to reduce activity is welcome. Saging has not worked. Well, to keep the house from chaos, I put an obsidian by the storage room where it's contained. It's still in the little baggie with instructions. The last one broke. Thought that might be better. Our Roomba picked it up, and I didn't know until I went to clean out the Roomba. If the obsidian is moved for even a moment, I'll have a week of nonsense. First thing to happen is the door separating the dining room to the foyer. It's a normal doorway. It used to hang loose. I'm talking. We couldn't even keep it closed properly. It would always be a jar to some degree. I was chilling with my dog watching TV. Living room is opposite the dining room from the door. We both hear this bang on the door, shrug it off like an old house noise. When I went to get water, it was like someone had hit the top of the door. The door drags on the bottom frame now. Not a huge deal, but someone would have to be crazy strong to do that. Second one was last night. My husband went to take the dog out. I went to the bathroom to get more drinks. Later on, the dog wants to play laser, so I'm looking for it and my hand lands on a nice little pile of three dog cookie treats. I pick them up and ask my husband why there's a stack of cookies. He's just as clueless as I am. Then he said the jar was open when he got back from taking the dog out. I gave the cookies to the dog.
For background, my family is very religious and I grew up in an extremely religious environment. Basically, my entire childhood, I never felt like I was alone. As long as I can remember, I felt like there was someone, I guess, lurking or hiding somewhere. I'd be scared to walk into rooms because I felt like there was someone in there. I was apprehensive to look out the windows, especially in the upstairs bathroom, which looked out over a big empty field. I hated being out at night because I always felt like I was being followed, even if I was with other people. I didn't feel safe. Sometimes I got this really strong feeling that someone was standing right behind me, like breathing down my neck close. To the point I was scared to turn around or look at anything reflective in case there was something there. There never was. And when I say they scared in this case, I mean stiff muscles, hair standing up scared. I genuinely felt like someone was right there. My parents always put it down to an overactive imagination, and so did I to a point. We moved house back in 2016, and nothing changed, so it's not like our old house was haunted, so it must just be me, right? Here's the thing. Around 2018, I moved out of my parents' house and also left their religion. I've not had this feeling since. I'm not scared to go out at night, to be alone, whatever. I actually feel like I'm alone now. I've had mental health checks and never had anything raised that could cause this. Just some background info. About five years ago, I moved into a house that's owned by my grandparents. My great aunt lived before I did and passed away of breast cancer about a month or two before I moved in. Now, she didn't die in the house, she died at the hospital and both my grandparents are still living. Since moving in, I'm not sure if what I'm seeing is real or if it's just my imagination. I can literally feel myself being stared at when I'm home alone. But when I look around, nobody is there. I felt cold breezes pass by me when I'm cooking. It's a small kitchen, so it gets hot when anybody cooks in there. But the weirdest part is my son. About two or three years ago, I suffered two miscarriages. I'd hear my son playing in his room and having conversations. He was an only child at the time. One day, I got curious and asked him who he was talking to, and he told me that he was playing with his brother and sister. I asked him how he knew they were his brother and sister, and he said that they told me the who they were. It gave me chills, but I brushed it off. Then one day, he came to me randomly and said that he won't be playing with his brother and sister anymore, because his new sister was on the way. Now at the time I just brushed it off because me and my fiancé weren't trying for any more kids since we had two miscarriages back to back. But lo and behold, a month later, I found out I was pregnant again, eventually finding out I was having a girl. Blew my mind that my son knew anything before I did. That was over two years ago. Now I've learned to live with whatever is happening. I thought it's my aunt who passed away because on top of the feeling of being stared at, Spices would fall off the shelf when nobody was in the kitchen, more so thrown instead of just falling, and I would say, hi auntie, and let it go. But I'm really worried about what's happening lately. Two days ago, my fiancé woke up out of his sleep, thinking our daughter was tugging at his leg, trying to get in bed with us. But when I woke up after hearing him talking, I turned my flash on my phone and our daughter was in her bed sleeping. My dogs have also been barking and whining at the wall and hallway when there's nothing there. Not to mention, I've heard footsteps that I thought was my son playing, but he was in bed sleeping. Being woken up from my sleep, feeling something touching me, but nothing was there. I've tried to sage the house, put black salt around the house and prayed, but whatever or whoever it is, isn't going anywhere. Is there any help that I can get? There's about 25-ish years of history here. Keep in mind, I completely forgot about some of the things I mentioned in this post, but they recently crossed my mind, since my most recent experience was about three weeks ago. I'm really looking to get insight on the situation. Just want to hear a different perspective from someone. Is this paranormal, or is there more to it? I've looked up the house history already, and found nothing. 
I moved back to my childhood home about three years ago due to hardships. I'm married to my husband now and we have three children. Backstory. My parents, brother and myself had moved to this house when I was three years old and I lived here until I moved in with my boyfriend, now my husband, when I was 22. Let me say, growing up, these hauntings became pretty normal. I'd always say, oh, it's just the ghost, when we heard weird things. I guess I would say it jokingly as a defence mechanism, but we heard the occasional footsteps or some voices, or I guess more like mimicking. The usual tapping or knocking, TV turning on, even had a music box turn on randomly. As a child, I'd have night terrors. I'd have distinct recurring dreams on a nightly basis, and my parents actually had a baby monitor in my room so they could listen if I was screaming or crying in my sleep. It happened numerous times where I'd wake up to them trying to wake me up, but I have no memory of the screaming or anything. These instances happened for years until they just stopped. I was probably around 8 to 10 when it stopped. Flash forward to high school and they start up again. Not the night terrors, but I would hear footsteps when no one else was home. One day, I was taking a shower and I heard my mom announce she was home. But in actuality, she didn't come home for another hour when she actually announced she was home. Like everything else, I brushed it off. I moved to my brother's room around this time since it was a larger room and he was living in another town. Since the first night in this room, there were always footsteps in the ceiling between 1 and 4 a.m. It became so normal, I slept with the TV on to drown out the footsteps, so I could sleep. So flash forward to now. My kids are aged 9, 3 and 1. About a year and a half ago, before my last baby was born, we had a couple of things happen to my now middle child. We had her bed next to ours, and she had her tablet before bed to wind down. One week, she started looking up at the ceiling and talking to it. And at first, we didn't think much of it. The next day she started laughing at the ceiling. I thought it was weird, but brushed it off. On the third day, she was showing the ceiling her tablet and laughing. I thought whatever it is, it's not scaring her, so maybe it's a good spirit. Day four comes around and she's showing the ceiling her tablet again and not laughing. And out of nowhere, she starts crying. She was two and really couldn't communicate what was wrong. I woke up my husband immediately and he said a whole prayer for her, and she was good after that. Nothing really happened after that until just recently. Let me say, I hear things a lot, so I usually look for others' reactions before I act on something. About three weeks ago, my middle child decided to sleep in her grandparents' room. It was about 11pm, and I heard my middle child's voice say, Mom, and my door cracked open. So I thought she had just come to get something, but changed her mind since the door wasn't fully open. So I thought it was weird, but tried to get some sleep anyway. Turns out my husband heard her voice too, and he asked what she wanted. So since he heard her too, I was like, I better get up and see what she needed. As I'm walking to my kids' room, my oldest was just walking out of the restroom back to their room. And I asked if she heard her sister. She said yes. I heard her say, oldest child's name, and run down the hallway. So three of us heard her at the same time. So I walk around the house looking for her with no luck. I go to my parents' room and sure enough, she's sound asleep. We all just heard her voice at the same time and thought she was up. I go back to bed with my husband and I tell him how our mid middle child was sound asleep the whole time. He made a face, just for shits and giggles. I asked him what he heard and he heard her voice. He said he couldn't make out what she said but he heard it by the window. So at this point, I inform him that we all heard the same voice, but all heard different things. I then told him about how I was a little freaked out and how it's bringing back memories from when I was a kid. The look on his face at this point was shocking. I guess my normal childhood at this house was a little too spooky for him. So the next day, my oldest child and I brought this up to my mom. She said a super long prayer with me and as she finished, our locked back door opened by itself. We didn't notice until she went to finish feeding her tortoises and asked if I opened the back door. We checked the door and it was still locked. So we're assuming whatever it was left. We haven't had anything else happen since. Could it really be gone? 
Or could it come back? Is this paranormal? Or could there be other entities? This experience happened to me a couple years ago and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and same area. I reached out to that person and they said I was the fifth person to reach out that has experienced something similar. So I figured I'd share my story here and see if anyone else has experienced this. Here's what happened to me two years ago. Some friends and I had gone camping up a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down, and have some fun like we'd planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like Truth or Dare and whatnot. It was me, four friends, and our friend's dog. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog who set up their tent a few yards away from us. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all. My friends and I were staying up and talking and laughing etc, when at some point it sounded like someone's car alarm went off, maybe 5 or 10 miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went about talking, until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened gradually, so we didn't notice until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again grow further away, until it sounded like it was 10 miles away again. This happened in the span of 10 or 20 seconds. As the night went on, we would hear the noise travel around from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away until about 3am. We tried to stay quiet for the rest of the night. Now whatever made the sound travelled the span of roughly 5 to 10 miles in 5 to 10 minutes. That's a whole mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there were no engine sounds with it and no headlights. It wasn't a human because it was not a single footstep or twig crunch even when it was right outside of our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal any of us knew about and it travelled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal. Here's some other important details. We originally thought the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and quickly got back to the beat afterwards. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or vehicle we considered everything from nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn. Nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5am to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we were getting up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them pretty bad too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9pm long before the beeping started. I recently got together with those same friends that I camped with back then and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But instead of a car alarm, the sound was a baby crying, travelling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading again. The people camping closest to us did not have a baby. Not 100% about this detail, because I don't remember her telling us about it up until last week, and the experience happened two years ago, so it may have been a misremembered detail. But then again, I was asleep when it supposedly happened. Another notable detail is that we were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. Anyone have any ideas of what this could be, or who have had similar experiences?
Anything will help. So this could be something or nothing. It happened a long time ago in 2004, but it stuck with me all this time. I was at a college house party in 2004 with a load of friends at his parents' house who were away on holiday. This happened in a quiet village in the south of England. Everyone was having a great time in the small cottage in the National Forest, though eventually it escalated into a very big shindig with lots of people we didn't know. In the end, the police were called when some older lads who no one knew started breaking out the Class A drugs on the dining table, as well as a mixing deck and it all got a bit overtaken by random people. At this party was a guy who I'll call H. He was in my year at school. I didn't know much about him, but he was one of the bad boys, always in trouble. But I never had any issues with him. I didn't even speak to him at the party. Anyway, after lots of drinking and with only a few people left, I headed upstairs to stay in my mate's little sister's vacant room. Fell asleep in a sleeping bag on the floor. And so I dreamed that I was on a cobbled street at sunrise. On the left was old terraced housing like you see in northern England. To the right, there was a large area of open shrubland, fenced off with a chain link fence. In front of me, I could see maybe 60 metres down the road, but the sun was low and so blindingly bright. I couldn't see the end of the street at all, just the sun on the horizon. It felt very peaceful and refreshing, as the sunrise does. No one was around. As I'm standing there, I notice a little boy loitering by the chain link fence, perhaps six or seven years old. He was crying and incredibly upset. With no one around, I thought I should go make sure he was okay. I asked him if he was alright and what he was doing here at this time of day on his own. He was still sobbing and he said that he had to go down there, pointing down the road towards the sun, but that he didn't want to go on his own because he was scared and that he wasn't ready to go yet. At this point, he started crying even harder. So not really knowing what to do, I said to him, hold my hand mate, there's nothing to be scared of, we'll walk down the road together. It'll all be okay, we'll just have a little walk, that's all. Would that make you feel less frightened? He settled down a bit and stopped crying, just sniffling a bit. He looked up and nodded, so I took his hand and we started walking towards the sun at the end of the road together. It's very peaceful, and after a minute or two, he's now calm, but still solemn. We get so far down the road and he stops, turns to me and says, I think I'm ready to go now, you don't need to walk any further with me. At which point he lets go of my hand and I watch him walk towards the sunrise. I don't really remember saying anything to him, just nodding and letting him walk away. I was waiting to see what happened when he got there, or at least make sure he was okay until he got out of sight. But then I felt a kick on my leg. My friend had come into the room I was sleeping in and woke me up in the dream. He wanted a drunk chat. I made some comment to him like, man, you just woke me up from the weirdest dream. Cut to the next morning. Four of us wake up hungover. Everyone else is gone, and we decide to have a fry up for breakfast. Two of my mates walk a short distance into town to get eggs, bacon, beans, bread, etc. And my other mate and I get in the hot tub and chat about the party. Half an hour later, the two friends come back looking a bit off. So, what's up with you two? H is dead. What? Well, it turns out H had died the night before, after leaving the party to get more drugs driving under the influence, lost control of his car and hit a telephone pole. He wasn't wearing a seatbelt and was ejected through the windscreen where he lay for a while and eventually passed away. He was 17. Anyways, my dream would have happened around the same time H died that night. And I always wondered if my dream helping that distraught little boy was actually H and I was kind of helping him to cross over. Sounds lame. I'm not a believer per se in things like that, but it was such a vivid and strange dream. Italy. It was 2013. I was 14. Waiting for my mum to come pick me up at my grandma's house. It was like 10pm in winter. 
I live in an important and populated city, but I don't know why. There wasn't anyone around at the moment. My grandma was looking at the window. Hey, come here, look, she said to me, laughing. I looked out the open window and I saw in the sky a giant UFO. Flying saucer. Same as the ones you see in the movies. It was up in the sky, but so big like the size of the building in front of my grandma's. But it was far, far away, so I kind of thought it was something big as a flying city. My grandma was laughing. Haha, <laughs> they came to say hello. Well, I was shitting myself. I was so shocked by her reaction. She was amused. A woman in her 80s, not scared at all. It was so big, shaped as you could imagine. A sort of dome on the top and a row of lights in a semicircle on the bottom, which lit up the clouds in front of it. I had a smartphone. I thought I could take a photo, but I was so scared. I thought, do I want this responsibility? In my mind, there were thoughts like, this is too much. What if something happens to me if I take a picture? What if they get angry? It would have been something so clear. How could my life change? So I didn't. And actually, if it would happen now that I'm 23, I wouldn't do it anyway. Anyway, I told her, scared, to close the window and not look at it anymore. I called my mom, 15 minutes after she picked me up. In the sky, there was anything no more. But the clouds were so fucking weird. I don't know how to explain this. They were low, so visible and distinct from each other and so little. My mom believed me, saying that in the past she saw something similar. My stepfather, a skeptic, made fun of me. I spoke of my friends living in the same area. No one saw what me and my grandma saw. My grandma isn't here anymore, so like, I'm the only one alive that saw anything, and I don't have evidence of it. Some people believe me, others don't. And actually, that's okay for me, because this fucking scared and still scares me. I've experienced some weird things in events that look paranormal. Things like my PC monitor turning itself on in the middle of the night and such. But this is always very sketchy because it could just be an electronic problem or something. Never a confirmation that the paranormal exists. But what happened to me on one night a couple of years ago confirms to me without a doubt that something paranormal happened right there and then. I was around 16 years old at the time. It was around midnight or 1am, and I was laying in bed ready to sleep, but wasn't very sleepy. So I decided to go watch some anime until I got sleepy, instead of rolling around the bed for two hours. I got up and went to the living room. I got to the living room, turned on the ceiling light, closed the door, and sat and laid on the couch to watch anime on my phone. The position I was sitting on made me have my back facing the middle of the living room where the ceiling lamp that illuminated the whole living room as day was. I watched three to four episodes of an anime, around one hour and 15 minutes, straight. And I remember vividly of not doing anything else or looking anywhere else in the living room. I'm also still yet to be anything close to tired or sleepy. I remember vividly of being totally conscious and alert. Also 100% sure I didn't fall asleep or something like that. Out of nowhere, I have this weird sensation, a feeling, like I'm being watched or something, like something is behind me or making me want to look back. After two or three seconds of having this feeling, I give in. I lower my phone and rotate my torso to look behind me. I look at the ceiling between the wall to my left and the ceiling lamp, and there's something there, a kind of smoke or foggy cloud. It's more like a cloud which is very faded than smoke. Honestly, it could have even been the thing that your eyes make after staring at a screen for a while. But what happened after made me discard that option. The cloud of fog was moving from the position I spotted to the ceiling lamp, close to the ceiling. It took two or three seconds to reach the lamp. As soon as the cloud got to the lamp, spark, my ceiling lamp's light bulb exploded and the living room went straight to darkness. The light bulb didn't just stop working, it made a blast inside of it and an exploding sound, but it didn't actually blow up and shatter the outside bulb glass. I'm petrified, so freaking scared. 
My reaction was to grab the sheet I had covering me and hide under it. I wait there for a minute or two until I gather the courage to run outside the living room. I don't remember exactly what I did afterwards, but I probably didn't get much sleep. Although I do remember that specifically when thinking about what just happened, exactly what I saw and what happened step by step, so I wouldn't doubt myself one or five years later of what I saw. When I was around 10 years old, I spent the summers at my grandparents who lived in the northern parts of Sweden. They had a cabin out in the woods next to a beautiful lake, a long way from the nearest town. We had electricity but no running water, so it was very rural. Just behind the cabin, there were dark, thick woods where an eerie feeling was present each time you ventured into them. Each year I went to my grandparents, I did so together with my cousin. We lived in a small cabin separate from where my grandma and grandpa lived. So when we wanted to go to their cabin, we'd have to walk around 30 meters. Our cabin being separate from theirs becomes important later in the story. One summer, my grandpa took us on a long walk out into the woods. Now, my grandpa was always special and during this walk, he told us stories about strange things happening in the woods, like stories involving trolls and other mysterious beings. On this special occasion, he told us about something which roughly translate from Swedish to little people. Small, human-like creatures invisible to the naked eye who lived in these woods. As we went along deeper into the woods, he told us that these little people sometimes crossed the roads where people walked. And when this happened, people wandering those roads would just freeze in place for no apparent reason until the little people had passed the road. My cousin, being a kid, proceeded to joke by suddenly stopping and proclaiming that he had come upon one of the little people trails and frozen in place. I laughed, but strangely enough, my grandpa was not amused. He was adamant that you should not joke about little people while in the woods. We thought nothing more of it and eventually went back to the cabin. Nothing happened for the rest of the day and later that evening, me and my cousin went to our cabin to go to sleep. We got around three hours of sleep until we were suddenly awoken around 3 a.m. by commotion going on all around the cabin. The outside of the cabin's walls sounded like they were being scratched by a large bear. Small pebbles were raining down on the roof and we heard scratching coming from underneath our beds. In short, it was very loud and absolutely terrifying. It was like being completely surrounded by noise and chaos. We panicked, ran from our cabin, woke our grandparents and spent the night in their cabin. The next day, Grandpa brought us back to the woods where we threw candy into the trees and said we were sorry. Nothing more happened after that and we never made fun of the local legends again. To this day, this is by far the most extreme experience I've ever had. The noise and how it seemed to come from every direction was insane. A little backstory. I was camping with my nephews. I'll call them R and J in a forest. Because we were bored, we decided to go for a walk in the forest. When you get past through the gate, there's a field with about five or six trees. Then you get a little hill and up on that hill starts the forest. When you walk to the back of the forest, there's a fence with behind that a road and a military shooting area. So R, J and I walked our normal route through the forest. When we walked past a tree, we saw some weird scratches on it. We've never seen them, even though we come there a lot. They obviously weren't human, but they were too high on the tree to be from an animal. We don't have bears or other giant animals where we live, so that wasn't an option. We investigated a bit and walked further. At least, R and I walked further. Jay stood still by the tree. We turned around and at that moment, we heard a scream and came Jay running for his life towards us. There was a stick that flew towards him and it hit his neck. We calmed down a bit, check his neck, we didn't see anything, and walked towards the fence at the back of the forest. We looked at the terrain when we saw a terrifying, literally black person about two meters long. Its legs, arms and fingers were all longer than usual. 
It had red glowing eyes and it was staring towards us. We were so scared that we ran back to the beginning, went through the gate and just stood there for a couple minutes. When Jay said, my neck stings, R and I checked his neck and we saw something at the spot where the neck hit him. I looked like a seven. We took a photo. After that, we talked about what we saw. When we turned around, it stood at the beginning of the forest. There were probably 20 meters between us and the creature. When he saw that we were watching it too, he ran away at an inhuman speed. We were too scared to get back in the forest and went back to our tents. R and J told their mom, my aunt, what happened, and she looked at Jay's neck. You could still see the scratch, but it was almost gone. For some context to the experience I'm about to share, I have to get into who Sassy was. Sassy was the familiar pet of my boyfriend's late grandmother, then passed down to his late aunt, who was watching her until he could take her. The way she passed is extremely upsetting, but without going into too much detail, I'll say that my boyfriend's dad hates cats and refused to bring her to their home. So he left her in the home of his late mother and sister, then forgetting to feed her. She was found passed away in the empty upstairs bathtub. This was long before I even met my boyfriend, and as an avid animal lover, I felt a deep sadness knowing that she went feeling alone and abandoned. I didn't know this when I first encountered her, so to speak. I had just moved in with my boyfriend, and we came to visit his parents' house. I believe for a holiday, or our birthdays. I was sitting alone in the living room while he spoke to his mother in a different room, when I heard a cat meow. It was clear as day and right beside me. I looked around, unable to find a source of where it had come from. The family has a basset hound, but no cats. Again, due to the fact his father hates them. When I asked about it, he mentioned that his grandmother and aunt had a cat that passed away in the house. I was later told about the way she passed away. This really upset me, and I wish that I'd been able to meet her. This was not my only encounter with her. Jump forward about two years. We've been together and we decided to move into his parents' home with them to help them out financially. We now have two kitties of our own and love them dearly. One day I was upstairs which had been turned into our sort of apartment and I was chilling in bed. My two kitties sound asleep around me. My boyfriend had gone downstairs and was talking to his mother. Then I started to hear meows. There were a few and I meowed back a couple of times, confused as my cats were both sleeping. They weren't soft or distant, they sounded as though they were right outside our room. When he came back up, I asked if his mom had brought a cat home. He said no, of course not, why? I told him I heard a cat in the house that wasn't ours. I believe without a doubt, the source of the meows are sassy. She's never made me feel scared or unsafe, and I don't have an issue with it being there. I just thought I'd share my experiences with her and tell people about her because she deserves to be known, even in the afterlife. <laughs>